All right, and uh, welcome back everyone. Um, this is the fourth in a series of conversations and I've actually prepared some notes today with great thanks to Toby Sinclair, who's done us the service of uh, writing up a bit of what we've been talking about, um, which is great because none of us could remember. Uh, so yeah, the three conversations before today, some of the topics that we've covered have been informal versus formal networks. Um, so the fact that a large proportion of organisational learning occurs in the informal networks. Um, these become critical sensor networks uh, and there's a different relationship to trust in informal versus formal networks. We've talked about the nature of organisation design interventions um, and the, the fact that it's easier to add interventions to a system than it is to remove them. So in effect, it's easier to scale than it is to descale. Um, talked about three types of interventions, stable, plastic, ephemeral. Uh, and a key note there is to be really careful that you get rid of the, uh, the ephemeral or the, or the temporary time bound interventions that you're making. Otherwise, they'll just stay in the system and uh, you get the concertina effect where you make it really complex and then have to blow it up later. Um, we've talked about the hope to spare cycle, um, the as is to be organizational design model, which is destination focused and has origins in cybernetics. Um, and how that uh, basically creates a cycle that's uh, negative. Um, alternative, the alternative is to start from, a, from principles and allow things to emerge. Um, we've spoken about the Spotify example, uh, both how that culture emerged over time and also the risks in copying a model or, or a snapshot of a model that is constantly changing uh, and trying to apply that snapshot somewhere else. Um, and we've also spoken about how inter in interactions or connections are really the key um, with some examples uh, in organisational scaffolding and also in the work of uh, Matt Skelton and Manuel Pace in team topologies. We've talked about some of the traps in organisational design, including designing in a silo, um, being destination focused, using recipes or playbooks, uh, which uh, an, uh, uh, send you in a direction of homogenization, um, the risk of being abstracted from context in design, of conflicting goals, and of the utilization paradox. Um, we've spoken about hierarchy, uh, which is becoming increasingly demonized, but has a real role to play in organizational design. That's an important constraint without hierarchy uh, you don't have a chain of command in a crisis and also importantly mavericks don't emerge. We spent some time on leadership, uh, particularly around the concept of how followers create leaders as opposed to leaders creating followers. Uh, we've spoken about the idea that some leaders falsely think productivity is uh, decision making in their roles and that in a crisis perhaps consult consultation is an inhibiting constraint rather than an enabling constraint. And finally, we touched on adaptive capacity, um, which is basically the idea that the aim of org design should be to increase the adaptive capacity of the organization. So we're looking for fluid structures that allow adaptation to, to uh, adaptation in design to changing circumstances. So that's been the last three. Um, what we spoke about talking about today is continuing on the theme of adaptive capacity, which has, uh, uh, brought a fair bit of interest and also moving into some practical examples uh, from our collective experience. Well, we covered some ground, Andrew. Yeah. So, uh, but I, I wrote some, I, I, I mm. took some of the same notes. I'm not going to read them out, but the adaptive capacity is something that really does sort of intrigue me and in how we could apply that in organizations. Um, it seems to have come from climate change or at least it's our origins is in how, how we adapt based upon climate change. One of the definitions here is adaptive capacity is the ability of a system to adjust to climate change, including climate variability and extremes to moderate potential damages, to take advantages of opportunities or to cope with consequences. Well, if you just remove the words climate change and, uh, or you just remove the word climate, uh, and just leave it as change um, or disruption, then that really puts us in the, the current condition with the, uh, the global pandemic and all the other sort of challenges an organization has. The issue for me is that most organizations see 
her adaptive capacity, meaning they've got staff org, they've got some contract with a consulting company and they, they pull people from some virtual bench that they don't have to maintain if they need additional people to do work or different skill sets. Um, and my reading of adaptive capacity, but I'm here to learn more than anything, is that we need to ensure people are in a continuous learning organization, a continuous and continuously developing new skills and capabilities and continuing to practice their existing skills and capabilities and that they're able to reform and adjust and pull from different parts of the organization to respond to uh, disruptions or chaos or other changes that they without having to sort of go and hire in new people. And it seems that the net, networks within the organization, those sort of loosely connected networks and even those sort of extended networks seem to be the way to leverage this. So that's my understanding, I think. I think it also raises the whole resilient robustness debate and then you've got to deal with the Taleb stuff about anti-fragile, which is problematic in its own right. And I think you've also then got the issue about whether you can take the biological meta metaphors over. Because I think if you look at the original stuff on this, it comes from Hollin and Gunderson originally, the stuff. Um, in a biological system, the feedback mechanisms can cause catastrophic failure, but human beings seem to have a capacity to go through a phase shift in a catastrophe and change identity structures. And so I think we've got to be careful on the straightforward biological metaphor here, because I think humans are, are you know, sick, more, more, more complex in that sense. Yeah. And a lot of this is term definition. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's it's the point. I mean, it's the point I got with Talib, which um, is I remember saying this is just before I got blocked and joined a company involving Simon Wardley and several Nobel Prize winners. And I said, you know, from my point of view, anti-fragile is a type of resilience, and we've known about it for fifty or sixty years. Symbiosis is an example. Yeah, which is not to say you're wrong. It's just to say I would use the terms differently because I think the resilient, robust thing, but. Taleb only wants acolytes, yeah? But I think that the key definition for me is a system which is robust survives unchanged. A system which is resilient survives with continuity of identity over time. And for me, a system which survives better by, you know, responding to stress or failure is one type of resilience. Yeah, but it's not the only type of resilience and over-focus on it can actually be quite dangerous. And for humans, the interaction between the informal and the formal is key. So I come back to the thing, if you have a dense informal network and everybody is within two degrees of separation of everybody else, that's really good news. But if you don't also have a formal hierarchy, it's really bad news. So you, you need multiple interacting types of organizational structure to create the resilience because you need, a lot of re you need, you need an awful lot of redundancy in the system. And, and the more you focus on resilience, the more redundancy you need, the less exploitative you can be, the more you focus on robustness, the less redundancy you need in the system. You see, that was the thing you were coming up with terminology. So I, I wonder if the, the, I'm gonna be very careful here with you and Talib, but um, whether or not the, the issue of anti-fragile is, is the book and the content and, and I've read it and I've seen many, many reviews of it. I, do, I think the concept of being anti-fragile in the, in, the, in the sort of definition that you don't want a fragile organization that's susceptible to impact and changes and, and breaks down very quickly when there's some sudden change. So I think the, the concept of being anti-fragile is this idea of being robust. And again, this is definitions. My understanding of robustness is that if something happens, your organization can resist it. Where resiliency or being resilient means that you can respond to it and overcome it if it happens. Whereas if you're robust, it doesn't impact you, which- Yeah, but for example, I don't want the column on my, or the steering wheel of my car to recover quickly from failure. I want it to be fragile. Yeah, yeah. the car as a whole is therefore resilient. And I think it's this trouble with Privilege in one term over all the other terms rather than recognizing you need variations on them. I don't disagree. So, what we're saying is we need organizations to both be resilient and robust. And you need on things the... which can break, which don't recover. I mean, I think that's part of the problem. If you have an over rigid hierarchy, 
yeah, with too many layers. It can't break when it needs to break. Right? Mm, so it's, 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 uh, there's an ability to reassemble very quickly with a different form, which I would, is part of resilience. And if your existing structures can't break, then actually you can't reform. See, that's the analogy of a child's bones. If a child breaks a bone, um, it is fragile because it's, it's a child's bone, but then it grows back more robust. And, and actually, that's a great analogy for leadership. But then how do we achieve that with leadership when leadership clearly fails at some point in many organizations? We see that right now. We need it to be able to break and then reform even stronger. The challenge is, is how do you stop those people who are different. in control? When I, did the sub, when I did the subdomain models on Kinevin, one of the things we, we did on the chaos space is we said if you face an unimaginable situation to which you haven't got a response, it's better to recognize it and start again. So it's not that you may want them to recover, it's also you may want a part of the system to fail completely. And if the system continues after its, after its necessary failure point, it may prevent the change coming through in time. How about the concept? You see, making me think, because of all the challenges we've got in the US at the moment, how do you, what about the idea of business leaders? You know, I know it's a weird term, but these executives in business being elected for terms and only allowed to serve one or two terms. So, you know, you've got this... Go, go on, Dave. <laughs> but again, you're coming, we talked about this before. You're, you're focusing on methods based on social atomism on the assumption it's all about individuals. If you have a crew, let's come back to where we started on this stuff, you can have different pilots. There's always a pilot, but the di different person can be doing it. That's, that's, what, that's a resilient system. Yeah. I also think there's a, there's a reason why when you look at the top organisations in the world, um, you, a common thing that you'll see is that the founder still has something to do with the organization. So whether it's Amazon, whether it's Microsoft, whether it's uh, uh, Tesla, whether it's um, Berkshire Hathaway, uh, that kind of constant involvement from someone who's, who's got kind of a, a, a vision and a need that exceeds a management term seems to be uh, a, a pattern for success over maybe the short-term CEO who's got like an EBIT focus or a, um, or a resume building focus. It's, it's also the issue about do you go for consensus build or non-consensus build? So in innovation, consensus is bloody dangerous. Yeah, and again, it's, the, it's this, how do you manage different things in different spaces? There are different roles. I mean, part of the problem we got is a universal. And one of the reasons why Talib is wrong is he's trying to create another universal. Now, yeah, universals think, are dangerous. Yeah. I think coming, um, coming back to the biological metaphor, Dave, I think there's um, so a, a very interesting article I came across recently is by um, a guy called David Woods who talks about this notion of graceful extensibility. I don't know if you've come across it, but um, Alicia Juarero actually introduced me to, to this last year. And there's, I think the other thing is there are different kinds of adaptive capacity. Um, so, you know, the, the essence of, of this that I really find really interesting is, is they talk about um, an organism and being fit for its, for its, for it, for its context, for its ecosystem. And when you're almost in the middle of, of your, she calls it an adaptive space, um, David Woods has other, other language for it. But when you're in the middle of that adaptive space, you're kind of adapting, your adaptive capacity is around adapting for things that you could plan for, things that's quite familiar. But you can start approaching the boundary of your adaptive space where you almost need to start, you need to switch to a different form of, of adaptive capacity where you're more able to um, deal with surprise, for example, and extend across that boundary to explore it adjacent possibles. And there's an inherent tension because the, the resources that you need to invest almost to optimize for the current context that you're in, that you're fit for, um, is completely different to the resources that you need when you're approaching this boundary. 
and these things are our intention. And one of the things that I find quite interesting is where they talk about if, if, if you're, especially in a, in a networked organization, if the awareness that you're approaching this boundary is not salient to enough of the nodes in the network, or it's not, not enough of them are experiencing it, they resist making the investment for that kind of capacity. And I think we can see that. So our, our organizations that have almost become too fit, they're over-optimized for the current context. And in trying to extend that optimality, we're reducing the, the resources that we need to be able to deal with unexpected events or to, you know, in Dave's language, almost to transform. To, um, I think the other thing that I find interesting is in the, in the eco ecosystem resilience literature, they talk about um, regime shifts. I think it's just a different you know, name almost for a phase shift. But it's this idea of... Um, small variables that we're not necessarily monitoring, creating what looks like sudden tipping points, but actually if we knew what, to, what, what we were looking for, we could have seen it coming. Um, you know, so how do we, you know, the way that we prepare for some of these regime shifts and the way that we um, create adaptive capacity when we're kind of in the middle of a more stable ecosystem are completely different. So I, I find that quite interesting, you know, the, the tensions that, that we need to navigate, how resources get allocated, how our drive for optimization and efficiency when things are stable undermines our ability to adapt when things suddenly change. Um, I think that, that could be a really interesting area for us to explore. Just some of what, listening to you, Sonia, but also listening to what Dave was saying, you know, I, I go back to some of the, the stuff I read that Cotter wrote some years ago about what he used to call a dual operating system, because Dave's talking about crew resource management, which is this ability of the organization to sort of form and reform continuously based upon its needs and, and, and what it's got to respond to. But then we don't want to lose the hierarchy altogether because the hierarchy, with no hierarchy, as you say, in a, in a crisis, in chaos, we have no leadership and we have no way of responding. The network just tends to bump into each other and get stressed. So Cotter used to talk about a dual operating system where you've got the sort of network of teams, which is your CRM sort of idea, but you've still got a, a reasonable hierarchy to stop the lunatics from the asylum because we have to pay bills, make sure people's human resource needs are taken care of and that type of thing. And, and I started to draw a picture thinking, well, you know, whether it's Cotter's model or, or something different, whether we could have this, this capacity, which is a CRM based system, which is our network of teams. And then the, on the hierarchical side where we need something, whether that could move into much more of an elective model where you don't get your narcissists who, who stay in power for 25 years and drive the ship how they want to drive it. You know, iceberg right ahead, pour on more coal towards it um, which is what we see uh, and so whether or not we can move to because he's frozen he is frozen I think idle yeah well I might, uh, I might I might add something so we we did some crude research with some of our customers very crude uh, a little while ago just looking at the number of value governance roles. So project management, uh, coordination, um, scheduling, kind of the roles that help uh, value flow through a matrix organization, as opposed to the number of value creation roles, which are the, the roles that you kind of put together in a project or, a, or in a, uh, a cross-functional team to, to create value. And, we kind of came up with this silly index that we use nowadays called organizational BMI, which is basically the, um, the ratio. Um, uh, kind of with that crude research, we, we found that the, the organizations that seemed to be doing things well, were running at about one to five, uh, or, or better. Um, so one, one value governance role to about five value creating roles. And we've worked with customers that have, uh, kind of almost up to one to two or one to three. So you've, you've basically got these poor people who are sitting there trying to create value, but they're spending all their days uh, 
filling in status reports or, um, or doing timesheets or, or reporting to some master that is ostensibly there to help them create value, but is actually taking them away from the very function that they're, they're asked to do. Um, and I think there's been, kind of been a bit of an industry that's emerged about that. But what, what, I've, what I've tended to find is that as that ratio goes up, the rigidity of the organization, the inflexibility, the inability to deliver value um, goes up as well. Uh, and coming back to what you were saying, Sonia, it's, it's kind of like, uh, and something that was said in one of the earlier conversations, it's kind of like, it's very easy to add that capacity because you can always say, look, I need a project manager to do the business case for the stuff that we haven't started yet. Or I need to, I'm running behind, I need to bring a scheduler in but it's really hard to pull that out of the system once it's in there. It just becomes a perceived need. And I suppose that's one of the reasons why I'm, I'm particularly concerned about the acquisition of Disciplined Agile by the PMI, because I've always said that if you've got a vested interest in not changing, um, which the people in the project management community do, then, then you're not going to change. And Agile, for Agile to work effectively and for organisations to be adaptive, you need to strip out a fair bit of that coordination cost and that, that governance cost in order to let value flow more easily. Yeah, but there, there are a whole set of things we need to look at on this, all right? So one is um, we need to look at what happened in the 80s, 90s in that we switched from lifetime employment. So if you had people who served an apprentice model through the company, they could be trusted to make decisions because they knew people, they'd grown up in it. It's what I used to call the matron case, yeah? So kind of like the matron picked up on all of the pieces the other systems didn't because she'd grown up in the hospital, she knew everybody, knew everything, it wasn't explicit. What happened in the 80s, 90s is we started to move people on to short-term employment, we started to employ them, for that. we took an engineering metaphor. So it's now very difficult for an organization to delegate because you haven't built the tacit and implicit knowledge and connections for delegation to work. And that, that's part of my problem with agile people. There's no point in just delegating to people just because they're people, you know, they, they haven't got the social infrastructure or role to handle it, which is why the bureaucracy creeps in, right? Um, so I think that, you know, that's a balancing act and we've got to rethink that one in terms of the way we build trust into processes between diverse people rather than into individuals. So in a modern organization, I would never delegate to a person, I would delegate to a process or a combination of people. Right? And that, that, that becomes a, a, as a way of rethinking that, right? I think the other thing which is interesting in David Woods is, is the whole point about graceful extensibility is defined to avoid a system becoming brittle, that's his key dichotomy. And you can see the engineering metaphors coming in because he's, he's integrated he's integrated systems engineering in background. So the whole, and I actually think in human systems, and I'll come back to where I started. This, sometimes systems need to be brittle um, because they need to break early. Right? So, for example, if I take my trekking poles, you know, this is a real case from the weekend. Right? Um, the really expensive bit is the carbon fiber pole. So the tips are designed so if you get twisted, the tips will break off because they're cheaper to replace. I mean, they're designed to be brittle, yeah? And I think we need to do that in organizations. We need to design some structures which actually break automatically if they face a context they weren't designed for, right? And I, I think we, we keep having this belief in continuity, which is actually what's dangerous. So you, you could, I'm not getting mystical here and, and you know, Nigel's arrived back. So I, I've, I've got to be, you know, you handled Texan, you know, the Texan attitude to religion. I've now got to be sensitive about because I know he's, he's likely to, you know, exclude me from all sorts of conversations if I don't pay attention to it. But there is this concept of rebirth. Yeah. Um, and it's quite interesting. You look at symbiotic species like Portuguese man of war or, or, or species like slime moles, which are fascinating, which can change from animal to vegetable based on context. It's the ability to become something different, which is one, one of the key features of resilience. 
Yeah, and that, that requires, you know, it requires us not to use engineering metaphors, but also to recognize this long-term human context. Sorry, Nigel, the point I was making, and Toyota used to have this, yeah, what lifetime employment does is it means you can delegate because you know that somebody knows people and knows things and knows process. So you can have less bureaucracy. The minute you get rid of lifetime employment and you just employ people based on skills, which is where Agile is, particularly with the whole certification scam, you end up with more controls because there's no natural evolved process which gives you trust. Actually, there's a case study for that. And talking about adaptive capacity, my entire internet connection died. So I'm now connected via my cellular service. And then I couldn't, and I had to switch computers as well. For some reason, one computer wouldn't work with a cell. And it's funny that Dave was talking about rebirth as I came back. I don't know if there's any inference there, but you know, hey ho. Um, so oh, I'll find a Salome for you one of these days, Nigel. So, but on the Toyota thing, that's a, a real truth. So in the 70s, we had two oil crises in the 70s. And Dave and I are old enough to remember those in, in the UK when gasoline was sort of worth more than gold, literally. Um, but at that time, Toyota got rid of a bunch of people. They, they, you know, like most companies, they sort of pruned when the, the inevitable recession loomed because of the oil crises. And, and everybody was scrambling for money. And then it was over, of course, within a year or two. I mean, these things come and they go. And then what they found was they were not able to recover as quickly because Toyota's way of working, I've described it before as a cult, and I don't mean that in the, in the worst connotations of the word, but it's a system in which it takes years to become expert in years to understand it in and if you suddenly rip out a big chunk of it you can't just shove some people with a bit of paper as a two-day certificate back in and it all recovers it takes years of understanding it's a whole philosophy a whole way of being the whole culture is the way we behave the way you do things and and if you suddenly disrupt that in a way that is, is catastrophic, it takes a long recovery period. And so the, the lifetime unemployment thing tends to be more of a Japanese thing, but um, it, the, the basics of it, of have having people there who know your systems long-term and can be adaptive if there, is a, if there is a crisis. And actually in the 2008, whenever it was 2006, 7, 8 recession that led into sort of 2010 onwards, when that started to happen, Toyota was able to adapt. They didn't fire any of their permanent members of staff. They were able to adapt, repurpose them, retrain them, reskill them, or reuse them in some other way, even down to community projects. The downside of that, of course, is that Toyota is a heavy staff org organization away from the manufacturing floor. When you get into the offices and the sort of non manufacturing parts, it is about 85% outsourced, which means that they can keep their employees, their team members employed because they can shed 85% of the workforce. But that does have some consequences because it means a lot of these people don't care about the Toyota way of doing things, nor do they ever take the time to learn it or become skilled in it. And so you end up seeing the organization, as my observations, run more like a traditional large corporate organization and it doesn't have all the values and behaviors and, and capabilities that you see on the production floor, which is where they make the vehicles. This is a balancing act, isn't it? And I think that's what organizations didn't do. So we saw the same with outsourcing. You hand over your whole computing to somebody, all right? And then discover what service level contracts really mean. Yeah. And it was actually one of the motivations when Kinevin was originally created, because I was going back over the history recently, all right? Was when I was working on the next generation outsourcing strategy. And it was kind of like, and I was saying to IBM, which IBM didn't like, it was one of my run-ins with Jimmy. Yeah, we, we need to withdraw from outsourcing mission critical work because that needs to stay in the company. Yeah, and they're going to realize the error and we're going to get a reverse process. So you, you need to create these much more fluid structures and it's what's the balance, right? So if I was dealing with something, say, in core manufacturing, yeah, you probably want quite long term employment, whereas junior level accountants, no, all right? And it's, it, it's getting, the, it's, it's understanding this both and type approach rather than either all type approach. And again, part of the problem with Agile is there are a bunch of bloody extremists. You know, everything, everything which has happened in, it's why they keep producing bloody 
you know, two, two column charts in which everything evil is on the left and everything glorious and wonderful and righteous is on the right. And it's, they don't realize that they need both. Yeah. Yeah. I saw your comments on one or two of those that popped up the other day. I, I just uh, hit them whenever I see them. All right. I'm, try, I'm trying to drive them out by derision. It's politics in general though, right? Unless you have both sides, neither side exists. People knew their theology. I mean, Manichaeism, uh, which is, it's actually the most dominant heresy in the history of Christianity, and it still applies in, in the States and the US. It's kind of like a belief that everything is either absolutely bad or absolutely good. And, you know, it's, it's a common belief, and it's a really scary one. The US does that too. Great, <clears throat> great aplomb, by the way. Whether it's bad or good, they do it to extreme excess. Mm. It seems that the UK, Europe has this balance of equally bad or good, but in the US, you're either incredibly bad or incredibly good. There's, there's no happy medium, which seems to be a challenge at the moment in, in society. That's an interesting challenge is we can set up an Albigensian crusade to deal with organizational design. And if you know your history, you'll know that that can be quite a cruel process. Yeah. <laughs> That's the kill well, I got, cho the I got chopped off in my prime when I was talking about Cotter and dual operating systems, uh, which I'm sure J Dave was pleased I got chopped off in the middle of that. Where did that lead us? Did we come up with any sort of practical uh, approaches for organizations trying to achieve a capacity that is truly adaptive? I don't think we, um, we really got there so fast, Nigel. Um, I, um, we were waiting for you to get to that level of convergence, but I think what we were, we were talking about, um, well, we did plan, one of the things that Dave said that I wanted to just explore a bit more is this notion of designing something to be brittle and to break, you know, almost at the right moment when it is required. Um, and I, I just, for, for the record, I, I don't really, from what I've read of Woods's work, I don't Really that he is um, really talking about things persisting necessarily. It's about um, adapting to be fit to an entirely new context. So to my mind, that also then includes this idea of rebirth or transforming. But one of the things that's really interesting there in terms of designing something that is, that is designed almost to break or that is designed to be brittle at the right time um, I think something else that's really interesting is, is if you see an organization as a, a network, so as a, you know, as a dis distributed network, there's also this notion of, because adaptive capacity, and I think this is where we ended with Jabe last time, which I, I'm, I'm really sad that he's not here, but adaptive capacity, I think he, he said it's like a budget, you know, you can run out of it. Um, and so there's this, Woods talks about this idea of it becoming saturated. And in a network, there's also this idea of reciprocity. So maybe, you know, so I, I guess one of the things that I'm curious about is if you do design something to break or you design brittleness, um, there's something that needs to be sacrificed there. And it might be that one unit in the network um, is able to almost bolster the adaptive capacity of a neighbor. Um, but, you know, there's, so there's, a, there's an interesting leadership aspect to this as well, is, you know, if you are almost in that coordinating role, how do you choose where the sacrifice needs to happen, where the brittleness will be built in? Um, and how do you... Sorry, and, and how do you... And I think the other thing is, you know, when you are in a stable ecosystem, if you want to call it that, and, and people can't really see the need for it, how do you um, convince people that, that, you know, that there's a need for it? You know, there are all these, it seems like multiple tensions and both ends, as Dave has, has said. But, I mean, we it's also that. talks about tangled, tangled networks or, ta or layered mm. networks. And I think the level of entanglement changes saturation, which is something his paper doesn't pick up on. Yeah. So if you if you change the, the type of entanglement, you get a greater capacity to absorb things. Right. The other thing is, and I disagree with Jabe on this, but we didn't get on to it. I don't think there's a limited budget. I think I think it's the same issue as knowledge. Right. Um, knowledge isn't a limited quantity. It's not that once you've used it up, it outflows. 
is just you reach a point where you have to go through a phase shift and the phase shift concept is key. Okay? And that's why I'm saying the degree of brittleness is important. So the system has to be able to go through a significant phase shift, which actually in a crisis, quite interesting, what happens in a crisis is the energy cost of change drops significantly because the context has made people prepared to do things differently. And you can see that on a micro level and day-to-day -day basis. You know, you get people fighting for, I mean, I'm not making a judgment call here, but you get trade unions who, when the, the factory is about to be closed down, suddenly become very cooperative on changing pension schemes, whereas previously they were threatened, they were threatened to strike over them. Yeah? So human systems have this capacity to change their entanglement, which changes the saturation, if I'm using Wood's terms. Yeah? And sometimes that's a, a break in reconstruction. Yeah? So now we're going through a lot of that in industry at the moment. I mean, the high street um, in the UK, I'm not sure about the States yet, all right? But the high street in the UK is not going to come back in terms of the big stores because, but interestingly, the small stores may survive better mm. than the, the small specialist ones. So we could see a resurrection of high street shopping, a destruction of out of town, yeah? And, you know, we, th those are the sort of patterns society needs to be aware of. But an unwillingness to let go is one of the reasons things don't change fast enough. Which is where I was continue to draw my picture here, which is back to the sort of idea that Cotter had floated some years ago, um, is that if you've got this sort of crew that can be a continuous learning <clears throat> network where, they are, where we've got continuous investment in learning, and to one of your earlier points, Dave, in another conversation, we need generalists, not specialists. And we seem to have shoehorned ourselves into a world of specialists where we've got mono-skilled employees, mono-skilled team members, where we need people with multiple skills and able to uh, go across a range of different sort of disciplines. So we need this sort of heavily, uh, or well, not heavily autonomous, but this, this network of teams that can constantly reform in this crew resource management way, which we have a continuous investment in learning in this learning organization is what, is what Toyota call it, um, that can respond and reform adaptively depending upon what the demand is that's called upon them. And then in the hierarchy side to create that, that fragility, to create that that, that, that brittleness and that rebirth, then we've got to have some sort of elected or elective type of leadership, whereas a CEO, CEO doesn't become a CEO for decades or the, and the, because what ends up happening then is you end up, and I've experienced this with narcissistic power centers that will not make decisions that need to be made and will not change their direction because they're single-mindedly in this sort of fixation bias on what they want to achieve. And no matter how great we make the capability in the organization, that capability can't function because the leadership constrains it or inhibits it in a way that prevents it from being adaptive. So how are you bringing Cotter into this? Because Cotter has the famous eight stages, which are terribly linear, which involve vision, vision, communication, and execution. So it's kind of like out of 1970s strategy, and I don't know why anybody takes it seriously anymore. So you're no, obviously uh, something I'm not seeing. So what is it? No, it was just his, it was just his concept of a dual operating system where you've got the hierarchy looking after the needs that a hierarchy is needed for. And then you've got this network of teams, which are, are what okay. he calls an army of volunteers, which are people from the hierarchy who voluntarily put themselves into the network for this adaptive capability. Now that's as far as I take the analogy or as far as I take the metaphor, it's just that idea that we need both, but one becomes an inhibiting constraint to the other because this never changes. The hierarchy is pretty rigid and fixed, sometimes for decades, but for many, many years. So it doesn't matter about the fluidity and the capability within the network, the hierarchy is constraining it or inhibiting it with an inhibiting constraint. And it's that bit I'm thinking of a way to get rid of. I mean, I think it's to look at what's the unit of analysis. So if the unit of analysis is the system or the organization, that, I think that's problematic. If on the other hand, the unit of analysis is, for example, constraints, 
then it becomes less problematic because you manage the constraints and that gives freedom for emergence, which is kind of like where we're going with complexity theory in organizations now. Mm. You stop talking about the system as a whole and start to identify constraints, change constraints, see what happens, have constraints which are brittle, have constraints which are you know fluid and so on. Yeah. And I, I think part of the problem is, and it comes back to the engineering metaphor issue, right? Yeah, and engineers are constantly designing a whole system, and that's one of the other problems with software. It's kind of like, and this is where we came on scaffolding at one point, right? Is you're 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 trying to create designs which doesn't require you to know the endpoint, and which are doesn't require you to work out what the optimal structure is. You want the system to work that out for itself. And I haven't got. I mean, if I was a Talib, I would now produce a catchphrase, a book cover, and and produce a best-selling book comprising ninety percent invective and ten percent novelty around that concept. But it's it's not anti-fragile. It's, it's it's something different. I think Nigel, you know, just tagging on to what you were saying about you know electing people for limited periods, you know, in into the hierarchy. You know, I think some of you know, just speaking from our political context some of our biggest problems comes from there because then people act with a very short-term view um you know they've got this four years in mind you know a new person comes in they reinvent everything you know so i'm um, i think it, it's very much a, a contextual i think it would it would differ from context to context um but i don't know if if that would necessarily um solve the problem i think and the other thing is this this idea of a learning organization or this you know um continuous learning this brings us back to that inherent tension between efficiency and optimizing for your present kind of context and success versus creating this resilience or adaptive capacity or whatever we're calling it because in most of the companies where i work people have no time to learn you know all of the you know that the, these organizations, they make Udemy available to everybody and, you know, they've got all these wonderful things up on the walls like we're learning and people are, are doing the, the jobs of three or four people because, you know, they let people go and they, they've got hiring freezes. So when must we learn? I think, you know, that is so we've stripped all of the slack out of our, our organizations and I think, um, and, you know, this kind of brings me back to the point is when things are going well and we're on this heavily this focus on on effectiveness and cost cutting etc cetera, etc cetera. how do we maintain this and so that we don't strip all the the um the slack out so that we do maintain you know some kind of of space for people so to learn etc et you've yeah i mean you, you've come hit on the key points and i wrote something about this a few months ago about being too lean and the fact that people mm. have abused what lean actually means and there's this whole nonsense debate about tps and lean being different things and actually inside toyota we talked we talked about lean we use the word lean all the time so it tends to be the people who have never worked at toyota <laughs> seem to have a problem with the term but the reality of it is, is that we, we use lean as a way that you just described to remove people and to push the burden to offshore somewhere, whether it was China or India or wherever, some other country, which was lower cost for manufacturing. But we didn't have resilient or robust supply chains and we didn't create that, 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 that sort of resilience and robustness in organizations where we are. And I was talking to an organization the other day where their major clients are people in America, yet they have no capacity in America because everything has to be kept in another country to keep the cost down. And then as soon as you disrupt the supply chain and the logistics, you suddenly can't supply your customers. So your customer's now in a mess and you're in a mess because this whole thing was too brittle. There was no, <laughs> to use the term again, adaptive capacity. There was no way they could adapt to that. So it became too lean. And I heard a phrase the other day, it was coined in the UK, Dave, by somebody been interviewed called economic sovereignty where you know this was more looking at a country level where basically or countries have, are now having to sort of look at local sort of economic sovereignty rather than the sort of global picture which is where they're having i'm reading some of my notes i scribbled on this the other day because what's happened is the just-in-time mentality was just too late and and actually if people study kanban correctly and study what ono did 
then we're talking about having sufficient buffer in the system mm -hmm. to meet the just-in-time demand, not eliminate all the buffer, which is what everybody did, and shove it 5,000 miles away and, and then assume that there was never going to be any fragility in that supply chain, which, of course, has now been proven. So, But this whole mentality of we're too busy to learn, we're too busy being busy to do anything else, has this nonsense has got to stop. And what this working from home has taught us is that a lot of the stuff we used to do in offices, which had no value, isn't being done right now because we haven't got the a capability to do all this wasteful nonsense. So what are we going to do when all this pandemic's over? We're all going to shuffle back to the office and then continue with all this wasteful crap we used to do before. Or are we going to recognize that a lot of that bureaucracy and red tape were inhibiting constraints and now we're still focusing on enabling constraints and actually repurposing that capability. But if people think that they can take a, you know, get a certificate in one skill and that will serve them well for the rest of their life and their organization's life they're, they're delusional they, they really need to be investing in continuous learning and the whole toyota engineer model if you look at the chief engineer model is over a period of years they do every every type of job in the entire life cycle of that product that they're going to be a chief engineer for but we don't seem to do that in other parts of the organization dave there's another related issue here which is the danger of professional management in some areas. So the example I often give is if I go into an American hospital, the, the guy in charge of the hospital or the woman in charge of the hospital generally comes in wearing a white coat having been on the wards because they're all doctors. If I go into a British hospital, yeah, and the advantage is I can go in without getting a bill, but if we ignore that for the moment, all right? Um, basically, the manager is wearing a suit surrounded by half a dozen administrators because they've gone down a professional management route. And the Americans are very sensitive. They have lots of people who are like Kelly in, in the famous TV series. Yeah? And I think we, we don't do enough of that. It was always a joke that one of the reasons the British car industry failed, even under German ownership, is in German, German industry, they assume the chief engineer will be the chief executive officer. So when but in Britain, they assume the chief accountant will be the chief executive officer. So when a chief engineer came in, nobody took him seriously. That was, the, I, mean, I remember the uni party explaining that to me. So I think that, and it comes back to this issue, there are some things where in order to be effective, you have to know things. And this is my that adaptation of Polanyi. We always know more than we can say. We will always say more than we can write down. And that's kind of like a spectrum. And where you are on that, actually is critical to organizational design. So that there are some things without a 10 or 15 year apprenticeship, you just can't make the decisions. You just can't do it. Yeah, or, or you'll create artificial processes around it. Yeah, so that, that kind of brings us to the end of the time box. Um, I'm not sure we necessarily got into the, some of the practical aspects that I was hoping we were, we were going to jump into today. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can the fifth one yeah what, what are the tools it's definitely that? the fifth one because let me tell you any even number software releases are usually shitty and not very good <laughs> only odd number releases are ever any good so this is probably an example of those even number releases i'm not naming yeah, hours you? after Walsh mountains where i've suffered near fatal injury i feel this is the <laughs> so five it will be all right so thank you so much for your time a pity we missed joe today but hopefully we'll get him back for the next one um yeah, uh, take care of yourselves and yeah, uh, particularly you, you, Nigel, in the States at the moment. Um, must be a pretty yeah, interesting thank place. You. All right, catch you all okay. soon. Bye bye. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye. bye.